Flying cars might be taking off sooner than you think. An aviation company based here in the U.S. is pushing it one step closer after receiving a special airworthiness certif certification from the Federal Aviation Administration. Now, this allows test flights of the sports car in limited locations. So Lori Garrow, which is joining us now, she is the co-director for the Center for Urban and Regional Air Mobility at Georgia Tech. Thanks for joining us. So this is like science fiction uh, coming to reality eventually. And so just because it has this FAA certification, it doesn't actually mean that we're going to be seeing these vehicles on the road or in the sky. This vehicle in particular goes on the road and the sky um, anytime soon. Can you explain like what the certification really means? Yeah, of course. Thanks uh, for having me here today, Emery. Um, so this is an FAA special certification for an experimental category. So this means that it, the aircraft can operate in limited use conditions. Um, two of the big ones are for exhibition, right? So just showing mm. people what the capabilities of the aircraft are, getting them used to the idea. But more importantly, it is, allows the aircraft to operate for research and development purposes. So being able to test it in different environments to help inform future designs that would allow it to become aircraft worthy where full paying passengers, it's safe enough for full paying passengers to fly it. So we've got like some specs on the screen of the Model A yeah. um, and uh, we can see that it's 100% electric, but how does this car work? Because it, it drives, but it also flies. Correct. So when you look at the car, it's very sleek, um, looks great. It looks like any other normal car. The first thing you notice is that um, it's a, it's not solid metal, though. It's got a mesh body. Mm. Um, mesh allows for air to go through it. So you can drive the car on the road, but behind or underneath, if you want to think where you're sitting, um, there's actually eight propellers and two wings that you don't see, so they're hidden. So if you want to take off um, vertically, the propellers basically aim to lift you off the ground. But if you want to go longer distances, um, you can't just rely on the propellers. The wings make things more efficient. So in that case, you, the passenger, are sitting in, let's say, your pod or where you would have your steering wheel. But the car is going to rotate behind you. And so um, if there's a wing, for instance, that's on the passenger side, two wheels, and there's a wing that's on the driver's side, two wheels, the car is literally rotating so that that... Um, wings basically are now behind you and you fly. So it's like this sort of rotation that happens that you don't realize, or I like to say all of a sudden now it's like I'm lying on my back um, where the, I mean, you're not, but it would be right. the equivalent of like lying on your back where the hood of the car would have been. So you're no longer looking at the hood, you're looking at nothing in front of you, right? The car's all behind you. Whoa, this is way cooler than anything the Jetsons had for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, so like I said, it does drive on the road, but it's actually, I think the maximum speed is like 25 miles an hour. It, it doesn't have the capability of going super fast despite the sleek look. It's really sort of meant for flying, but I, you know, just like electric vehicles, where it's only now that they're kind of really investing in the infrastructure that's necessary. I imagine you're gonna need some specific infrastructure for a vehicle like this, like it needs a place to land, right? Right, so um, clearly you need a lot of infrastructure. The key would be if you're operating on batteries, you need charging infrastructure, right? right? So <laughs> that's gonna be a big one. Um, I do believe that you're gonna need dedicated takeoff and landing areas. And part of the reason is if you can imagine um, these eight propellers are generating a lot of downdraft or wind, yeah. right? So you don't want to be landing it in a normal street where pedestrians are walking because that would not be safe. The wind may even knock them over. Mm -hmm. um, the other infrastructure that we often don't think about is the airspace itself, right? So mm -hmm. when we're on the ground, we have red lights and stop signs, things that tell us how we can merge and who has the right of way. Um, we would need to design the airspace or look at things to avoid conflict with drones, conflict with commercial aircraft, um, but also maybe merge lanes, right? There could be highways in the sky that we use to fly these aircraft in. So you should tell people that like the video that we're looking at right now, I, I presume has been provided by the company. We, I don't think we actually have video of whatever their, their prototype looks like, but this is kind of the best case scenario. They already have people who put down pay, a down payment down. Uh, the expectation is that this vehicle is going to cost about $300,000. The last video I saw from the company says that they got about 440 people who have already, you know, put money down and they want, they want this vehicle. Um, they, they say production to deliver their Model A, which 
which is just a two-seater, they mm -hmm. expect the delivery date to be sometime in 2025. And then they're working on a four-person sedan that would be delivered by 2035. Yeah. From your perspective, is this a realistic timeline? So the way I like to think about this is there's a lot of different design hurdles that we have to go through between, um, you know, getting, let's say, the first aircraft that passengers can fly in off the ground, <laughs> pun intended, uh, versus something that might um, really be able to be integrated into our lives. So a next hurdle would be going through the manufacturing process, this Model A, um, sort of demonstrating that it is um, has another level of airworthy certificate um, certification. I think 2025 is probably a little aggressive for that. We're yeah. seeing FAA take its time, right? Um, these are new aircraft, a lot of different situations we haven't faced before. So I think having a more realistic, you know, expectation on that timeline is appropriate. Um, but the other example I like to give is when we had the jet engine, believe it or not, when we had the jet engine to fly from London to Tokyo at the beginning, took 10 stops in 36 hours. Wow. And now we're down to a nonstop with 14 hours. So when we think about where these cars are headed, there's gonna be a lot of trade-offs between getting new battery power to let us go faster and longer, yeah. um, as well as on the ground, right? 25 miles an hour is a low speed vehicle. Um, I like to think about it, we're sort of in the classification of almost a golf cart, right? <laughs> that we're using in the retirement communities. Right. Um, controlled settings. This is not a, not a car we're going to be able to take on the highway. I have one more quick question, too. And I don't know if we know this, but I know, like, drones are actually pretty loud. Just a good yes. quality drone. Do we have any idea how loud this vehicle would be? So it's quieter than a helicopter is what we are um, being told by the design community. So the propellers and the distributed propeller system um, is quieter than helicopters. They could still be noisy. Uh, but one of the other advantages of using these distributed propulsion systems is you can sort of direct the noise away from certain areas. So if you're flying near schools or sensitive populations, um, you have the ability to direct noise away from them, which could be another advantage. Well, Lori, I'm typically an old early adopter on any technology that I can afford. This one I might give a little time, though, to work out, work out the kinks. Uh, Lori Garrell, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie.